Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody at the intersection today. Um, it's, you know, whatever it is outside, but it's been nice having some drizzle and rain. Boy, talk about needing it and we could use a little bit more. We're going to do some announcements just so to give a little time for others to join in. Um, there's one announcement that I want to share. I'm going to bring it on screen. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with AITSCM. I'm going to scroll back up here. The American Indians in Texas at the Spanish Colonial Missions. If you're not aware of them, it's you need to be aware of them. These folks were around long before the 300 years of San Antonio. And um, so they are opening tomorrow. So that's where I was. And I'm going to scroll down. They have a grand opening of a new location, a headquarters. It's amazing. And it's something really, um, I think, important to our city that we have this center. We've not had anything quite like this before. And when you consider it's so much a part of who we are as a people, um, and also to recognize a lot of the healing that we still need to do in this particular direction in our history. Um, and it does relate a little bit to our trauma-informed care this morning, but uh, historical trauma, ancestral trauma, um, and we've we've got some of that, uh, that around here. So I encourage you to, the grand opening is tomorrow. It's at 1616 East Commerce. And I haven't gone to the detail, but we will go there and see what it shows us. Save the date. Uh, 10 to 5. But I think a lot of the, there's going to be food and all sorts of things all day long. But I think the there will be like an opening ceremony about 10, 10, 15. The mayor and others uh, will be there. Um, it's really, there's an open house tour and, and it tells you a little bit more here what's, be, what's going on. Oh, there's an opening blessing. Anyway, I encourage you to attend. I plan to be there. Uh, are there other announcements? that people would like to share from within. Yeah, yes, Martha um, Ann? Um, people are still welcome to join Compassionate Integrity Training. We had a great start Tuesday night, uh, 6.45 to 8.45. A good group and room for more. And I'll put in the, or um, I'm not in a good position to put in the chat box. Um, Anne, are you able to put the link in the chat box or a little bit later I could put it in? Uh, I will do my best and find it and put it in there. Thanks a million. So Compassion and Integrity Training um, is a 10 session training once a week for 10 weeks, and it started this last Tuesday, but I know you can catch up. Uh, Interfaith Welcome Coalition, and then Emma. Uh, yes, um, Interfaith Welcome Coalition is having their annual um, backpack drive this weekend at 300 Bushnell Avenue, UPC, um, at UPC from nine to noon. Great. Uh, do you want to go ahead and put that information in chat as well? Yes. Maybe we'll even a couple times again then later because people who come later don't see the chat. Emma, do you have something? You took your hand down. Yes, I do. Um, Bridges to Care will be doing um, one of our youthful tracks. We started on yesterday speaking to the adults about youth, but this Saturday from 10 to 11, it is on Zoom. It is mindfulness for the youth quieting that alarm that the youth have going on in their brain. So we're looking for a great time. We had a great number on yesterday speaking to the parents and teachers teaching them how to, um, to work with the youth. And this, this Saturday, we'll be speaking to the youth. So if you have some children, some young people, nieces and nephews, that you think that this will be an um, a awesome thing for them to come to, Miss Donna Costa is going to be the facilitator. It's going to be fabulous. So this Saturday from 10 to 11, it is in the chat. And I will keep putting it in there through um, through the remainder of the time. Thanks, Emma. 
For sure. those who aren't familiar with Bridges to Care, it's congregations and then schools and other folks around them, but cohorts of congregations in near geographic proximity who are working together, but also going through 20 plus hours of no cost mental health education. And they're now, as Emma's explained, they're now expanding into care for young people. And I also know that they're expanding the Spanish speaking portions of the work as well. So not just the training on Saturday, but if you're uh, interested and want to know more, you can connect with Emma. I also see Doug here, but um, just let them know. Okay, it's 8.05. And I want to turn this over to our friend and colleague, Mary Beth Fisk, with the Ecumenical Center for Religion and Health. Uh, that's out at the Med Center. If you've not been to that beautiful facility before, you need to sometime go out there. They have regular trainings going on. Uh, it's just a beautiful location. Um, I asked Mary Beth to come today uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, the major one is the San Antonio think big, is becoming a trauma-informed city and how that impacts those of us here on this screen. Um, but it interlinks with so much of our work, the violence prevention plan that's happening with the city, uh, our domestic violence prevention via congregations that we're doing. That's just a, a good intersection point. And as leaders, um, I really feel that we need to know what this trauma-informed care um, means, what kind of education can come with that, what might happen for you and um, those you lead and where you serve. So I'm going to hand this over to Mary Beth. She's the executive director at the Ecumenical Center. Mary Beth, thanks for being with us this morning. Good morning, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be with you today, um, bright and early in the morning. Um, I have a few slides. We'll just kind of walk through those very quickly. Um, but um, as Ann says, there's been a concerted effort over the last several years to uh, work towards becoming a trauma-informed community throughout San Antonio and Bear County. Um, can you see the slides? Are yes, so we can. Wonderful. Thank you. So when we talk about resilience and we talk about uh, trauma-informed care throughout community, some of the things we need to focus on first are really what place formed you the most? And if we can take a moment for self-reflection, um, looking back at the way in which uh, we were formed, the what, what were those pivotal moments in our lives where uh, they had the greatest impact on us? And some of those may have been positive and some of those may have been negative. We're gonna talk about the difference on that this morning, just briefly. I think, um, my PowerPoint is thinking for a moment, but we'll just keep going while it catches up with us. Um, so really, if we began by talking about what is trauma, that's um, something that we're all very familiar with, but it's, it's good to take a quick pause and define that. And that is really anything that results from an event or a series of events um, that set circumstances that are, is expected by an individual, either physically or emotionally harmful or threatening um, over a lifetime. And those can carry through with us over a lifetime. I'm gonna let Sandy navigate the uh, audio visual while I keep going, if you all don't mind bearing with us. So um, what are traumatic events? If we look at uh, the study of trauma-informed care, and we look over time, we know that trauma, traumatic events fall into one of three categories. One is abuse, which could be physical, emotional, it could be bullying, so many different things. Chronic stressors is the second category, which in, is inclusive of poverty and racism, substance abuse, that sort of thing. And then loss, um, loss, through the death of a loved one, lost through accident, separation, divorce, many other things. Those are all attributes as the studies have shown that constitute a traumatic event. And over a lifetime, we collect traumatic events. Okay. So we'll go to the next slide. I think you closed it out. I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah. That's okay. 
we're very patient here. You are very sweet. Okay. Yeah, we've we've been at this for three yeah. years. This is not the first tech glitch rodeo. <laughs> Great. Okay. okay. Let's see. Are we in share screen? I did put in chat while they're looking the link for the compassionate integrity training. We don't see it as much in the CPR because there's a lag when it comes up. Here. Okay, I think we're back on track, everybody. Okay. For your patience. It's okay. So if we talk about the effects of trauma, what we know is that we don't see the things um, as always that they are, but we see things as we see them based upon all of the influences we've had over a lifetime. And trauma can be uh, conceptualized as a normal response to an abnormal situation. There are uh, different types of stressors and we deal with these every single day. Um, positive stressors can be things that we increase our heart rate, mild elevations and our hormone levels. And that may be because we're giving um, a lecture, we're speaking or we're doing something. Um, and that kind of stress is not necessarily negative. It, it can be a positive thing. Tolerable stress is another category. And that's of course, serious temporal buffered by supportive relationships. So there is a outlet that you have. I know this is repeat for many of us on the call today. But toxic prolonged stress is one of the things that we need to avoid in the absence of protective relationships. So just put another way, positive stress, meeting new people, tolerable stress, maybe the, the loss of someone, person in your center of community, a loved one. Toxic stress is something that's more ongoing, like addiction issues, parental addiction, neglect, or abuse. Working for the city. No, I didn't say that. Did I say that out loud? No, <laughs> I'm teasing. Go ahead, Mary Beth. Sorry. So what we can see scientifically, it's proven that uh, trauma has an impact on the brain. And uh, this is just a high level, um, quick snapshot of what we see on MRI. You can see a healthy brain on the left-hand side where you can see in the temporal lobes, there's a lightness, there's activity. So that red area that you see is a great deal of activity. Um, the, on, on the other side of the slide, on the right-hand side, you'll see the temporal lobes and you'll see a dark area. That um, is the brain of, of a, a young person who has been through uh, trauma over abuse and that sort of thing for a period, for a long period of time. So uh, this, in, in, this particular image is from a Romanian orphan. So you can tell that there is physiological changes um, in the brain based on trauma. So typical brain, we begin learning things as a young person, as a baby and move forward. We are pretty safe. We're not having to fight for survival. But if you look at a traumatized brain, first they have to fight to survive. And so that takes up the bulk of the um, activity of the brain and it changes the way in which um, the individual's development and neurobio, uh, neurobiology develops over time. So we know of uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, that's kind of stated in the negative. We'll talk about the positive side of that in a second. But through Dr. Folletti's work, uh, abuse, both mental, physical, and sexual abuse, many other kinds, family violence, alcohol, substance abuse, um, down to incarceration of a family member, where there's an absence of that family structure can be and is counted as an adverse childhood experience. What we know about this is that there are main stressors such as, you know, loved one moving away, a loved one passing away, a major move, peer pressure, and then the global pandemic for which we've now all experienced a trauma in that. But many of us carry traumas over a lifetime. Um, the study that Dr. Folletti and company did, it was the relationship of childhood abuse and household dysfunction to leading to uh, the causes of death as adults. And, and if you just take a quick peek at the slide, the more adverse childhood experiences based upon this study, the more social, emotional, cognitive impairment that there was along with that leads to an early death. 
But to the contrary, we began looking at things kind of universally within the scientific community at resilience. And so fostering resilience through positive childhood experiences and protective factors is, is where um, we really want to make sure that we're balancing this conversation out. So we know there's negative outcomes. We know that over a lifetime that's going to happen, but we know that there are positive things as well. So we want to make sure that the positive outweighs the negative side. In a study uh, that was done at Johns Hopkins in 2019, relatively uh, new materials, it looked at protective childhood experiences. Um, and that is where we can counter these adverse childhood experiences. And over 6,000 adults were surveyed and seven categories identified are connected to improved mental health and social connectedness through these positive experiences. Some of the uh, attributes to positive experiences are I felt like I could talk to my family about my feelings. I felt like they uh, stood by me in difficult times. Uh, participating in community traditions, uh, belonging, a sense of belonging, having friends, having at least two non-parents that actually took interest in them. That could be a teacher, that, that certainly could be a clergy person, many um, uh, other adults that are in that field as the, the child adolescent is growing up. So protective factors, when we look at this, we know that there are ways, such as we talked, that can improve the ability that counter risk factors. Some of these protective factors are social connection, um, parenting skills, nurturing attachment, um, personal resilience. We see, we see that in many cases when someone has had multiple traumas and we watch the way they re respond to those traumas. Um, that's, that's definitely something that is um, for some, it, it's an easy thing to do. And for some, it takes some coaching. And that's why we do have supports through counseling and, and other types of support like you all provide each and every day. And then there are community protective factors. That is access to safe neighborhoods, safe schools, employment, transportation, uh, quality child care, just to name a few. So it's really about how we respond to uh, someone who has been traumatized. We can collectively say now that we've gone through COVID, we've all been traumatized. Um, but in many cases, we don't necessarily share our previous traumas, but it's all about what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. If you think of this in the context of a student in school, why does that child act out? What's wrong with that child? Why can't they act like everybody else? Well, maybe we need to ask the question, what happened to that child instead? So we need to understand uh, the trauma perhaps that some, that folks have endured and recognize that there may be another approach. Perhaps that's the choice of words. Perhaps that's a cho choice of actions that we can take. And we'll um, talk just a bit about what that might look like. So how do we respond? We recognize substance abuse and eating disorders, depression, anxiety, or symptoms of trauma. Um, but what we can do is we can offer respect. We can support, we can inform, we can connect, we can um, give hope that recovery is possible. Um, the worst thing in the world is to say it's never going to get any better, right? So we want to give them hope. And um, I know that you all do that every single day. And then post-traumatic growth. So once a trauma has happened, it's with you. It is, it is part of who you are, but there is growth beyond that that can result in a healthy life and trajectory. So trauma-informed care realizes that widespread impact of trauma, it truly understands there's pathways to recovery and it recognizes those signs and symptoms, which we just fairly very high level touched on today. And it responds by fully integrating the knowledge about trauma in everyday policy, practice, and procedures. And it seeks to resist re-traumatization. Those are really the key pieces. It's important because again, it understands and recognizes and responds. And it helps us to be trained and sensitive, if you will, in, in working with those individuals that have experienced trauma. 
they're what we call the four R's of trauma-informed care. And that is realize that there was a trauma, recognize the signs and symptoms, respond in a way that is uh, not challenging the individual, but in a way that is supportive of the individual and resist those words that and or actions or body language even that could be re-traumatizing to uh, the individual. Just briefly, there are six primary principles to trauma-informed approaches. That is making sure that people feel safe. That is safety from a physical standpoint as well as an emotional standpoint. Making sure that there's an ability through the practice and the relationships that are being built that are trustworthy and transparent provide support through peer support, be collaborative, have mutuality, empowerment, voice, and choice. Choice is so important, especially to adults as well as children. And then ensuring that we're looking at things from a cultural lens and making sure that um, that's an overarching, we believe that to be involved in every single domain because there is history, there, is, there are rituals, there are cultural things that we need to be mindful of as we um, implement uh, and change policies and procedures. So self-care, there, uh, there is truly a cost to caring, but is it too much? I would say that everybody on this call does that every day. You're caring for others and you're creating a safety, a safe place for people. And that's, that's very centric to trauma-informed care. Just a bit about our city and our community and what we've been working on for the last three years, um, where you have the goal of becoming a trauma-informed county. Um, and this um, goal, you know, re really working to migrate the effects of adverse childhood experiences, that's the negative, um, into becoming a certified trauma-informed community. We have a consortium. The consortium is 650 organizations strong. That includes schools, congregations, and includes um, many different um, so service organizations, medical organizations, mental health organizations that have come together and said, we see the merit in this and uh, we, we really want to pursue this. And the pursuit is to become trauma-informed certified as an organization, which takes time. It takes one to two years, um, generally for most organizations to go through the process. Um, in the structure of this effort, we have a governance council um, we have um, tri three tri-chairs. We have uh, two members from the Institute. I need to update this slide. We have two members from the certifying body, which is the Ecumenical Center. And there's a circle that basically talks about training, making sure that training is readily available and at no cost for organizations and individuals throughout our community. And then that there's an opportunity to um, take the standards and domains of certification and implement those with consultation to um, allow for your organization to meet those uh, standards and become a trauma-informed certified organization. I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Uh, again, the Ecumenical Center serves as a certifying body. Um, there's a series of, of standards domains that were developed um, here that were very culturally relevant to our community, and that's the foundational level of level one. Level two standards are now prepared and going to be going out um, and will allow organizations, once they've achieved level one certification, to um, advance to level two. Um, we currently have 80 organizations in the queue that are working on their certification process. That does include a couple of our congregations from the community. Um, we also um, have certified by the end of this month, actually by the by mid next week, we will have five organizations certified. The Ecumenical Center, in order to be the certifying body, is nationally certified in trauma-informed care as well. So really kind of coming back to, to the whole conversation is we are building resilient communities, and that is through healing, restoration, and connecting. So. Um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to share a bit about trauma-informed care and the certification process and happy to entertain any questions. One, wow. Talk about 
putting a whole lot of information right in a small space of time. Thank you, Mary Beth, for doing that. I think too, in terms of some of our more common language at the intersection, um, trauma-informed care is a form of compassion. So understanding our own adverse childhood experiences, our own trauma-informed care is about ourselves as well as those we are around and work with, which is true of compassion and in systems. And um, to not only be aware of that kind of, that we all have trauma and we experience that, but also then to, to act, um, not just awareness, but to be able to move and act within that knowing to become more compassionate and caring. So of course it does this healing, restoring and connecting in the process. I see that Andre has a question. Yep. Yeah, well, not a question, just a comment as we, we are part of cohort 10 with term informed care. And so I appreciate Mary Beth and her overview of this. And, you know, when I think about trauma informed care is not only taking care of the clients we serve or the people we serve, it's taking care of us as an organization. And so I, I look at it from that perspective and going through this process and looking at it, understanding that we as a team, we have trauma too, and we have to take care of ourselves. So this way we can take care of others. So I just want to throw that comment out there. So thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyer. I think too, if I remember correctly, and uh, Mary Beth, you can correct me, but I think that San Antonio is one of the first cities across the country to go and try to do this on such a large scale. I know all the staff, 13,000-ish of the city are going through trauma and care, trauma-informed care training and becoming certified. Mm -hmm. So that's good news. I know when I was at Haven, we were all trauma-informed then, and it continues to work there. Uh, Doug, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, one additional layer to what Mary Beth said. Um, the presentation was excellent, but several years ago, we had a psychiatrist from Brooklyn VA, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, come talk about cross-generational trauma uh, and the research that they've done. And it's it's a real thing uh, that trauma, that the effects of trauma are passed down uh, from generation to generation. And of course, there's resilience and recovery. But I think sometimes we need to also just recognize that that uh, it's cross generational, and it crosses history and time, and you know, for to the seventh generation kind of thing. There is there is that wisdom that we already know, Mary Beth. If uh, before we take a pause here, if a congregation organization wanted to become certified, or even just to learn more whether they wanna go through the certification process, right? They don't have to do that. Sure. But how would they go about doing, learning more, engaging more? They can contact us and I'll put my email and my, my cell phone number in the chat and we can get more information to them. We have um, cohort work group meetings where they can come and learn from others that are going through the process and see if it's something that they would find useful for their organization as well. Um, so happy to share more information. We encourage everyone to pursue um, trauma-informed practices, if not certification. Uh, it certainly is going to make for a healthier community and a healthier uh, congregation, both internally and externally. I also know that um, there are ongoing, no-cost trainings around all of that um, that comes out of your partner. Mm -hmm. In this, I know that, I mean, one, I just want to say to everyone, the Ecumenical Center in this effort, particular effort with the consortium, is a large and perfect example of the intersection. I mean, think about it in terms of the Ecumenical Center, which is, you know, faith-based, directly in large partnership with city and county in making this work happen across our city. It's, it's just such a perfect example of that. Um, I know that I'm on a mailing list, so I get regular information about that coursework that comes through. Do you know how people can get, I don't know how I got onto that mailing list other than going to consortium meetings 
pre-pandemic. So do you know how to do that, Mary Beth? Absolutely. If, they, if folks want to just use one of the two contexts that were in the chat, we're happy to get them to the city. Um, folks that are working towards, uh, that add to that mailing list. So if you want to send the, your information and just ask to be added to the mailing list, I'll make sure that Alex at the city has that and he'll add you to the list mm -hmm. of the consortium. Makes me think, I wonder how seminaries and uh, places like that. Uh, I did not, but it's been several decades now, but I did not have trauma and for care uh, education in my seminary experience, but it would be a very interesting question to ask. It's 8.30, I'm gonna take a pause because I know that some people need to move on. It's part of our commitment, our compassionate commitment to each other to respect our time and stay on time. So those of of you who need to move on, thank you for being with us this morning. Hope this was helpful. All of our uh, at the intersections are recorded and they are posted at sacred.org. And I know Billy's already put that into chat, but he's gonna do that again. Um, it's a perfect place to get updates. Um, you can find out about all the collaboratives and you can like minus all of my conversation and get a good tight 10 to 15 minutes and really learn a lot about what's happening in our community and the work that we're able to do together. And uh, hope to see you next week at the intersection. Um, do we have uh, other questions or thoughts or efforts that we wanna share that we've heard about in terms of this certification process? I, I have a question. Um, so, um, I love, I, I love what you're doing. I learned a lot. Can you tell me of the religious aspect of it? I'm from the Jewish Federation. And so um, is it Christian based or is it, um, how is religion incorporated? Actually, that's left up to the organization, how they want to incorporate okay. that. It's basically um, how we treat one another. It's taking mental behavioral health concepts and it's just good ways of being compassion, compassionate and respectful of others um, and creating safe environments. So um, that's that aspect of it would be left up to the organization. And it's a perfect opportunity too, like within religious faith settings to then, you know, in your particular one to make like theological connections and spiritual connections from your tradition and how those relate uh, and interrelate. It's a great question though, Lisa, thank you. Others, comments, thoughts? This was really good, Mary Beth. Thank you so very much. Um, not quite sure what we're gonna be just hearing about next week, but it's gonna be good, I promise. <laughs> um, I'm just really grateful that you're all here today. Um, yeah, I'm just grateful. Grateful that we have one more day together to be about this important work. So um, I hope that you all have a great day, great weekends, and uh, maybe I'll see you tomorrow at that grand opening. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next Thursday at the intersection. Thanks all for being with us. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.